how could we invalidate the Big Bang? How do we know Hawking radiation is real? And how would we search for life as we don't know it? All this and more in this week's question show. It's time for the question show your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, the question pops into your brain, just write it down, I will gather them up and I will answer them here. Now I record this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to come and join the live show, it's about twice as long as the episode that you're watching. It is like back and forth questions and comments with other people in the chat. It's a lot of fun. So I think you'll probably enjoy it. Although I know for some of you, it is in the middle of the night. And that's just a sacrifice that you're gonna have to be willing to make. All right, let's get to the questions. Mickey Mickey, I appreciate your comments, Fraser. But what evidence could the James Webb telescope come up with that would invalidate the Big Bang Theory? Every theory needs to be falsifiable or it is not scientific. Absolutely. Every theory needs to be falsifiable. And I'll give you a practical example, right? Like there is the theory of gravity. And the theory goes, if you are holding something and you let go of it, it's going to fall to the ground. And the way you falsify that theory is that you let go of things and one of them will float. Like the same thing, like you hold a rock, you let go, rock falls, right? Over and over and over again, the rock keeps falling until this one time the rock flies off into space. And then you go, ha ha, the theory of gravity has been invalidated. And then people have to come up with a new theory that explains why most of the time when you drop a rock, it works, but every now and then a rock flies off into space. So it's that same process. And when you think about the Big Bang, what are the underpinnings of the Big Bang? There's like three major lines of evidence. The first line of evidence is that when you look out into space, in all directions, galaxies are moving away from us at the largest scales. Now, obviously, we've got some close by galaxies that are trapped in our gravity well, but far away galaxies are moving away from us. And so the more the light from that galaxy has been redshifted, the farther and faster that galaxy is moving away from us. And so if you were able to see a galaxy that you could confirm independently, as being very far away, like through supernova, type 20 supernova inside of it or Cepheid variables or something like that. And is it the kind of distance where these galaxies should be moving away from us, and yet it is not moving away from us, you would have invalidated that part of the Big Bang, this expectation that in all directions, galaxies are moving away from us. Now, like it said, very close to us, we can have galaxies that are that are moving towards us like Andromeda, like Triangulum, like some of the dwarf galaxies, but at the most distant scales, they're all moving away from us. So that's like one pillar of the Big Bang. Second pillar of the Big Bang is the cosmic microwave background radiation that you look out into the universe. And at the very limits of what you can see, you're going to see the oldest light that was able to escape into the universe. And this is the cosmic microwave background. It was red light at the beginning of the universe. But over the course of 13.8 billion years, the wavelengths have been red shifted out and they've shifted from visible light into infrared into the microwave. And so if you're to look out into with a really powerful telescope, say like JWST or something more powerful than JWST, and instead like, like you point at something which is where the cosmic microwave background should be, and you start to resolve it into galaxies or something like that, that would allow you to invalidate the cosmic microwave background or if you detected it at different wavelengths than what you're expecting. So if for some reason, the CMB was coming at you in gamma radiation or x ray radiation, and not at a wavelength of light that perfectly matches what it would look like if red light was red shifted over 13.8 billion years, that would start to cause cracks in that pillar of the Big Bang. And the third pillar of the Big Bang is that there is this very precise ratio between hydrogen and helium. And we see this ratio in the sun, we see this ratio in Jupiter, we see this ratio in giant clouds that are forming stars, wherever we look across the universe, we see this ratio. And what this was was that shortly after the universe formed, you had the density of everything was so close, it was as if the entire universe was like the inside of a star. And so it was undergoing fusion, just like you have inside the sun where hydrogen was being turned into helium, and it only lasted for like 12 minutes. And then it was over. And it sort of froze into place those ratios of hydrogen to helium. So again, if you look out into the universe, and you start to find places that are like 50 50 hydrogen to helium, mostly helium, a little bit of hydrogen stars made of carbon only, 
or an entire galaxy made of stars made of carbon, then you would know that this understanding of the ratios of hydrogen to helium is doesn't hold up under the larger observations of the universe. And it's those three big observations that are what is predicted by the Big Bang that you should when you look out into the universe, you should see galaxies moving away from you, you should see the cosmic microwave background, and you should measure those ratios of hydrogen to helium. And any of those could be overturned at any time with good observations. I'm sure you've noticed the Star Wars planet that's appeared over my shoulder. This is a way for you to vote to give us some feedback on how we're doing. What is the question that you thought was the best this week? And each week we will look up the winner from last week and celebrate them. Last week, the winning vote was from Matthew Serum. Why do we keep holding on to the Big Bang Theory, which is wrong and James Webb proved it. And so I guess people love that question. You really love when people ask why the Big Bang is wrong, or maybe you liked my answer. I don't who can say but watch all of the questions in this video, oh, I guess I should say. So congratulations, Matthew, congratulations to me, we make a good team. Uh, definitely watch to the end of this video, you see all of those planets put in the name of the planet that you like the best, we will count them up. And we will celebrate the winner here next week. Dicky chap. Hey, Fraser, something I've never been comfortable with is Hawking radiation, how the scientific community can be so sure it exists when there's no experimental proof of it. Isn't the entire principle of the scientific method that you make a hypothesis, you devise an experiment to prove it. And if that experiment determines conclusive evidence, then the postulation becomes accepted. Why is it universally accepted when there is no known way to prove it? Thanks. Hawking radiation is absolutely not universally accepted. It is a prediction made by Stephen Hawking that radiation and other particles should be able to escape a black hole as the black hole evaporates. You know, we've done other videos about exactly how Hawking radiation works. And I've done bad ones like there's much better places out there like PBS space time where you can get really a great explanation of how Hawking radiation works and what the predictions are made by Stephen Hawking. But you're absolutely right. It has not been detected. It has purely been hypothesized by Hawking. And then you've got a lot of other scientists who are taking the ideas that are proposed by Hawking, doing the math, adapting it, applying it, seeing if it makes sense in other theories that are working, they're attempting to come up with ways that you can disprove his theory or ways that you can extend it. But you're exactly right. The proof is in the pudding that you know, my favorite people in the scientific community are the experimenters. So like the theorists are fine, right? Stephen Hawking, he's okay. But it's the experimenters who I really have a fondness for, because they are building an apparatus to search the universe to collect data. And in many cases, they don't know what to do with the data, right? When you look at the people who are detecting the accelerating expansion of the universe. That was not what they were planning to figure out when they measured the distance to these different supernovae. When you look at the people who were able to create the large Hadron Collider or the LIGO facility to be able to detect gravitational waves, like just the detail that goes in the work, the painstaking process to make an experiment that is able to make those kinds of detections, like I have so much respect for the people who who decide as scientists that they're going to follow the experimenter route. And the experimenters and the theorists, they work hand in hand. So the theorists come up with ideas. And then the experimenters try to prove those ideas or disprove those ideas, or the experimenters study stuff, and they generate data. And then they go like they hand this stuff in a pile in front of the theorists and they go, I don't know what to do with this. What does this mean? And the theorists go and they do their math, they try to figure out what all this stuff is, and how to be able to make sense out of it. And so the two really have this great hand in glove relationship, um, hand in hand together. But like, I really like the experimenters. And so Hawking radiation is the perfect example of the kind of problem that theorists came up with it did the math made the predictions. Every other part of black holes is lining up nicely to what Hawking has predicted. But no, nobody has detected the existence of Hawking radiation. And nor could we using astronomy like the distances are so vast the time scales for 
giant black holes to radiate away is so long that we may never be able to find it. But there have been attempts. So one prediction made by Hawking is that you're going to have the smaller black holes are going to radiate away faster than the bigger ones. And if you have say primordial black holes, ones that were formed at the beginning of the universe, they would evaporate within minutes within years within millions of years within a few billion years of the beginning of the universe. And so we would look out into space and be looking for that final gamma ray pop as the smallest primordial black holes are evaporating away. Astronomers have looked for it, and they haven't found it. So the prediction that there are primordial black holes and that we detect them through Hawking radiation hasn't paid off. But you can see like, Hawking made this prediction, astronomers tried to use that prediction to find primordial black holes that are evaporating. And so far, they haven't been able to do it. And the other way to go about this is with the Large Hadron Collider. So when they smash atoms with high enough energies in the Large Hadron Collider, one of the possibilities is that you could get a black hole form from the particles, it would be very small, and yet it could form. And then it would, before it even hit the ground, it would have evaporated away in a little burst of Hawking radiation. And that's something that the experimenters could detect. And so far, they haven't been able to detect it. But there's another run of the Large Hadron Collider that's coming up that's going to try to do it. So this is the process like you've Hawking made a prediction, he took a theory, everyone thought the theory was very elegant, they liked it, but it is provisional and nobody has been able to find evidence to prove it. And they may never and so it can never cross over into a more established theory. And like at this point, people are in the comments are going to have an argument about what the word theory means versus hypothesis versus I don't know, criteria versus like all of these kinds of terms, but like, Hawking had a hunch. And experimenters are trying to see if his hunch might be correct. And we'll find out. Or we might never find out. And that's okay, too. D O. Where are we at the search of life as we don't know it, not just as unusual animals, but different chemistries and processes? I've read about a few different theories, but is there any real analysis going on? Though I do love tardigrades. Well, we all love tardigrades. <laughs> People loved in the previous video, the pictures that Chad put up while he was showing the different animals. And I think he put hippos next to tardigrades, which was hilarious. But um, yeah, so the search for life at this point is very much about life as we know it because we know it. And so we understand that where we look around Earth, wherever we find liquid water, we seem to find life at the bottom of the oceans inside nuclear reactors, high up in the atmosphere, deep under rock, wherever we go, wherever we find water, we find life. And so it makes sense to say, okay, everywhere we found liquid water here on Earth, we found life, we know there's liquid water on other places in the solar system, like under the ice on Europa and Enceladus, and maybe even in Pluto, Callisto, Ganymede, all of the ice planets as well, there could be liquid water under the surface on Mars. Maybe there's pockets of liquid water on Venus. So let's go look in all those places because it justifies the everywhere there's liquid water, we find life. But we haven't had a chance to look as thoroughly on these other places as we can. And the analogy that I always use is like, if I said, could you bring me an apple, you would start by checking your fridge, and then maybe you would go to the store and maybe you check an apple tree, right? Like you're going to start for the low hanging fruit, pardon the pun. But after a while, you're going to be like, well, I haven't found any apples anywhere. So now I'm going to go to some of the places as I wouldn't expect apples to be found. So you would look under your bed and you would dig a hole in the ground and you see if there's an apple in there and you might. I don't know, right? Like you're going to you're going to check unusual places to find apples. And when it comes to the search for life, like we understand how traditional life works very comprehensively, we get the chain of the chemicals, the solvent, the need for energy, the waste products that are produced, we know what DNA looks like. And so we just we have a way to find it in these kinds of scenarios. 
But to go for life as we don't know it, that is more complicated, right? Because then all of those things that we assume could be different. There could be a different kind of solvent that's being used for the, for the life. There could be different chemicals that are forming the basis. They could have different requirements for energy, different kinds of outputs, different chemistries that they use inside their cells, or they don't even have cells, who knows, right? So then to take it one level farther, you think, okay, so could there be life that does the same kinds of things as life as we know it, that uses energy, has a membrane, does some chemistry inside, puts out waste products, but does it using completely different systems? Yeah, sure, maybe. And then you can go one farther and go, could there be something that is that doesn't do any of that, and yet still could be considered life. And after a while, you start having these arguments, what does it even mean? Like, wh what is life? <laughs> right? And really, the only proper definition for life is like, you know, when you see it, NASA has a whole astrobiology group, and they put out some really interesting documents, they have meetings all the time, and often will propose ideas for life as we don't know it. There's one really great document that I read a few years ago, where they went through and proposed like, every single possible solvent. So like we use water, but you could use ammonia, and you could use liquid nitrogen, and you could use it like at different temperatures, different chemicals can start working as a solvent. And then we have uh, carbon based chemistry, but you could have silicon based chemistry, maybe you could have boron based chemistry, and each one of them would have a different kinds of inputs and outputs that scientists could look for. The most generic way that you could search for life is to look for complicated chemicals, chemicals with a lot of bonds that just in general, if you've got very simple things like water, silicon, aluminum, then chances are you don't have life. But as soon as you go into a place that has life, like here on Earth, and you just measure the chemicals that you find, you start to find these long chain carbon atoms. And then you can find other kinds of, of chemicals that are produced by life. And then humanity through our through our modern industry, you create even more complicated kinds of chemistry. And so if you could just like take a sample of any world, and then just examine the chemicals, the longer the chemicals get, the more likely it is that you're dealing with life, but we don't even know that for sure. If you like my answers to your questions, as well as the other things we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. This allows us to keep a minimum ads for everybody. Like as you can see, there are no ads in the middle of this video. As a patron, you'll also get an ad free experience on university.com for life, even if you unsubscribe, you'll get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. C. Joshua D. Miller, Diego Marchicelli, Ben Barris, Dennis, Frank Aquino, Mark Tilly, Patricia Loquette, Bill Crowley, Stephen Wilson, join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Six pence Zach. Hey, Fraser, I could never understand how you study the wobble of a star with a planet orbiting it when there are other planets orbiting the same star creating their own wobble. How does that work? So the technique to find planets around stars by their wobble is called the radial velocity technique. And this was the method that was used to find the first planets discovered around a pulsar, but really the first major planet back in 1995. You believe that? that we've known about planets around other sun like stars since 1995. And the method is called the radial velocity technique. And what happens is that when you have a planet orbiting around a star, the gravity of the planet is actually pulling on the star at the same time that the gravity of the star is pulling on the planet and the two are orbiting a common center of mass between the two of them. And what you get is you get this wobble, so that instead of it's just perfectly the star sitting in place and the planets going around, the two are kind of wobbling around each other. And when you look at the light from the star, you measure its chemical signature. And you see these very specific spectral lines in the star. And then over time, as you watch, those lines will shift back and forth and back and forth. And you can measure the speed that the star is coming towards you and away from you. And based on that, you can measure the existence of a planet orbiting around the star and how massive it is and how long it takes to go around the star. It's kind of amazing that they're able to to do this. So when astronomers are detecting multiple planets, 
it does make their lives more complicated because now you have to account for the movements of multiple planets that are all pulling at the star in different ways. And so you're going to have you know one planet that's up close, one planet that's a little farther. And you can imagine that when the two planets are on one side of the star, it's being pulled over more than when the one planet's on one side of the star and one planet's on the other side of the star. And they just make a ton of observations. They just watch the motion of the star and they watch the speed that the star is moving towards us and away from us and towards us and away from us or the way it's got some kind of weird oscillation. And they're able to tease out the existence of multiple planets through all of these different signals. So it makes their job harder. But they're still able to do it, which is really incredible. Slam RN. Do you know what it would take to protect humans from cosmic rays on a long journey? The so cosmic rays are particles that are accelerated to enormous velocities and astronomers aren't still 100% sure what causes them. But it's believed like they're maybe they're coming from supernova or they're coming from the accretion disks around supermassive black holes or they're coming from magnetars like whatever it is, it is taking individual atoms and accelerating them so much that they can have enormous amounts of energy. Like we can't create particles with that much energy using the Large Hadron Collider. And when one of those things hits your body, it passes right through and just shatters any DNA that it happens to hit. And over time, shattered DNA has a tendency to turn into cancer. And so we know that for airline pilots, right when they're flying at high altitudes, they have a higher risk of cancer than people who spend their time down on the ground protected by the Earth's atmosphere. And we are protected. We have the magnetosphere around the Earth that redirects these cosmic rays and causes less damage. We're protected by the atmosphere that helps to block those cosmic rays, you know, as a as a cosmic ray is trying to make its way down through kilometers and kilometers of, of atmosphere it runs into a air particle and sort of collapses or sprays into a bunch of sub particles and it's gone. And so thanks to the atmosphere, thanks to the magnetosphere, we are protected. Once you're out in space, you are receiving hundreds of times more cosmic rays than you would down on the surface of Earth. And so the damage piles up quickly. The astronauts on board the International Space Station are still protected by the magnetosphere. And so they get less damage from cosmic rays than people who might be on the moon or just in deep space. So what would it take to protect humans from cosmic rays? And the answer is matter, stuff, protons. So really, you need about one meter thick of water or rock in between you and space. And then cosmic rays are going to try to get to you through a meter of water, they're going to hit some of that water, and they're going to be stopped and you're going to be safe. And so when you think about a spacecraft, right, spacecrafts have these paper thin hulls, of like aluminum, or maybe a few other things sandwiched together, they're designed to stop micrometeorites, they can help against the solar wind, but nothing can stop a cosmic ray except for mass protons, you need as many protons between you and the cosmic ray. And at this point, you're you're about to say, why don't they just create an artificial magnetosphere? Why don't they just run some kind of electric current? And people have been working on this idea for decades, like there are papers back in the 1950s, 1960s, where NASA scientists are like, we should build an artificial magnetosphere to protect astronauts from cosmic rays. And every time they try to do this, like there's been new superconductors that you'd think would make this easier. It still is too expensive, too complicated, too much mass to do the protecting that at the end of the day, the simplest thing is just put as much material between you and space. So currently, there is no plan that when people go to Mars, they're going to spend say nine months in space to going from Earth to Mars. And they're going to be unprotected that entire time. And they're going to receive hundreds of times more cosmic rays than a person down on Earth. And then they're going to make that trip back from Mars. Hopefully, when they get to Mars, they can spend some time underground on Mars protected by the regolith. But we just have no way 
to protect them. So anyone who wants to make the trip to Mars has to understand that they are dramatically increasing their chances of getting cancer later on in life. And yeah, if you've got ideas, awesome, bring them. Um, NASA would love to hear them. If you can solve the how do we keep astronauts safe in space, NASA is all ears. I've been interviewing people who have gotten NIAC awards and almost every year there's a new NIAC award of some group that's attempting to solve the problem of radiation in space. I'll put a link down in the show notes to the most recent interview that I did, which was pretty cool. But I've done many of them in the past. I'm fascinated by the idea and I would love for someone to come up with a solution. But so far, all of the reporting that I've done is always, we can't solve the problem in a way that is more efficient than just putting a slab of water in between the astronauts and space. And that would be a great idea, like find a comet, dig out the inside of it, have the astronauts sit inside, done, solved, take an asteroid, hollow the inside of the asteroid, have the astronauts sit inside of that great, you just got to be able to move an asteroid, and they're big. So it's tricky. Gaming with dad. Why don't scientists send identical telescopes to L4 and L5 to take advantage of interferometry? So we talk a lot about interferometry here on the channel. And the idea of that is that you can separate two telescopes and they act like one telescope together with the size of the baseline, the separation between those telescopes. And the core of this was used with the Event Horizon Telescope, where you had various telescopes around the world working together as one gigantic virtual telescope the size of planet Earth. And each telescope turned on a very accurate clock, started recording radio data of the Event Horizon of a black hole, and then all that data was merged together on a supercomputer, which lined up the observations down to the millisecond, and then was able to use all of that data to produce these incredible images. And the idea could absolutely go to space. And it doesn't just have to go to an L4, L5, like you could just have an interferometer sitting on the moon, or sitting just in orbit around the Earth. And as long as it's in radio waves, and as long as it is recording with a very accurate clock, and it's able to send its data back home to Earth, in a reasonable amount of time, like the thing would probably be like mostly a transmitter, but if you can get that data back to Earth in a reasonable amount of time, then you could have a telescope that is not the size of the Earth, but a telescope that is the size of the Earth to the moon, or a telescope that is the size of the Earth to Mars, or whatever you want to do, right? So whatever that separation is. But the problem with interferometers is that they only work at the longest wavelengths using clocks. If you want to make an interferometer work at tight wavelengths, then you like visible light, if you want to make a visible light telescope, then you need some other mechanism for being able to line them up. And this is like an engineering challenge. And there's something that's going to be launching in 2035. That's going to take a crack at this. And that's the LISA observatory, the laser interferometer space antenna from the European Space Agency. And this is going to be a gravitational wave observatory, you're going to have three spacecraft that are in a sort of triangle shape, and they are going to be tens of 1000s of kilometers away from each other. And yet they're going to be acting like one single observatory. And as one of these is moved a little bit away from the others, you're going to be able to detect that these are these giant gravitational waves that are moving through. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to detect the gravitational waves from colliding supermassive black holes and other things like that. And so yeah, you could absolutely send telescopes to L4 and L5. But the Lagrange points, ah, I'm so glad we're talking about Lagrange points, L4 and L5 are like blobs. And the there is no exact center to L4 and L5, right? They are just blobs that are dependent on the position of the Earth compared to the sun compared to the moon compared to Jupiter compared to Saturn. And just in general, objects get caught in these Lagrange points and orbit around in them. The, but over time, they shift in and out of the Lagrange points, they can be captured by the Lagrange points, they can escape from them. And so the, this is the long way of saying that it's really hard to get those two telescopes to nanometers accuracy every time all the time so that they're able to observe parts of the sky to 
together. But there are some really great ideas. Like I think my favorite idea is to make a radio telescope like the Event Horizon Telescope. And you put one telescope at the Earth Sun L4, one at the Earth Sun L5, and then you put another one at the Earth Sun L3, which is on the other side of the sun. And you get this giant equilateral triangle that is the size of the Earth's orbit. And you can get those three telescopes one which is on the, the far side of the sun it's gonna have to maintain its position the ones that are in the L4 and L5, you can have them shifting around in the L4 and the L5. So they stay roughly where the legs of the this triangle are roughly the same size all the time within a few hundred kilometers. And then if you do this in radio waves, you are able to create a telescope that is tens of millions 150 plus million kilometers across. And can you imagine the resolution you could get with a radio telescope that big. So every now and then there are plans to create a telescope that big and we report on them on universe today all the time. I'm fascinated by the idea. But we are decades away from someone doing this. Tony Kona, many Americans aren't aware that the US military have been flying its own space shuttle for a while now and no one knows what those space shuttles are doing up there. Do you have any clue? Yeah, the US Air Force, I guess now Space Force has their own teeny tiny space shuttle called the X 37 B and actually have a few of these and every couple of years they launch one of them and they leave them up in space for a couple of years before they return to Earth. And they seem to have payload bays like the space shuttle. And we kind of know what they do because with the most recent X 37 launch, NASA had some experiments on board the spacecraft. And so they were able to report what they were doing. And it was that they were testing different materials, different experiments in space for long periods of time. So like, what could you do with a spacecraft that orbits around the Earth that has payload bays that open up, and it sits up there without any humans on board for say two years, like what are the benefits of that? It doesn't really move from its position in orbit, it just sits there. And like the obvious answer is that it's designed to test things in space. The US military is building all kinds of computer components, optical components, radar communication systems, they need to figure out, you know, each generation if their next technology is space hardened can handle being in space for long periods of time, as well as materials as well as just like other stuff that they're going to want to test in space. So, you know, I have no knowledge of this, right? It's classified, no one tells me. Um, but based on on the experiments that NASA did, um, which was that kind of a thing. And based on like, like what you would think you would use that kind of a platform for my guess is they take all of the stuff that they're planning on using in space in the future, and they put it in the x 37 and they send it to space and then they operate it for two years and find out if it's degraded at all, because they can bring it back down to Earth and they can examine it. How many micrometeorites hit it? How many cosmic rays hit it? What kind of damage did was done to the hardware and the software and the optics and all this kind of stuff. And then based on that, they're able to figure out what stuff they're going to put in their actual spy satellites. So uh, that's my guess. You know, like I'm waiting for the black helicopters to show up. I promise I don't have any classified information. I'm just speculating on what I think the X 37 is for. Lance Piles, Fraser, what excites you most about the juice mission? So the juice mission, this is the European Space Agency's mission, the Jupiter icy moons explorer. This is the spacecraft that just launched a couple of weeks ago, it's on its way to Jupiter, when it arrives in 2031, it's going to be imaging Callisto and Europa, and it's going to spend most of its time at Ganymede. And the thing that I'm most excited about is that we're going to have this mission that's going to spend most of its time at Ganymede. I mean, like I mentioned this in a recent space bites, that Ganymede is the new Europa that Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It has an ice sheet just like Europa does probably has geysers like Europa and Enceladus. But it is so massive that it has its own magnetosphere, which is something that Europa doesn't have. 
It has a bunch of other really cool features. There was a new science paper that came out that says that they think they're going to be able to detect ice falls on Ganymede. So you can actually see where these avalanches have happened on Ganymede. They're smoothing out the surface of the moon. And so I think the Ganymede is, is as exciting as Europa for all of the same reasons that it, it seems to have a large liquid ocean underneath a thick shell of ice. It's got, you know, all of the raw materials for life. And yet because it is large, it probably has more internal heat volcanism, but at the same time, it's farther away from Jupiter. And so it has less of a radiation load than Europa has. It has a magnetosphere, so it can even protect itself from the radiation that's coming from the sun and from Jupiter and from deep space. That's the thing that I'm most excited about. And unfortunately, at the time that I'm recording this, the European Space Agency is having trouble getting the radar antenna that they're going to use to scan under the ice on these various moons, they're having trouble getting that deployed. It's only about a third deployed. And they think there's a problem with like a pin that's holding part of the radar array in. And they're going to try accelerating the spacecraft and then decelerating it and see if that will sort of shake this loose and they can extend the full radar. But it's like they can't extend this radar boom and they get all the way to the Jovian system, and they're not able to make their observations. That would suck. So Please, I really hope that the engineers get this solved. And who knows, by the time Chad edits this video, the problem will have been solved and he can just remove this whole part. But if you still see it, then the problem hasn't been solved yet. And I'm sad. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who asked questions in the YouTube comments. And thanks to everyone who showed up for the live show and asked your questions live. Remember, we do this live Monday at 5pm Pacific time, there should be a reminder somewhere here on my channel, go click subscribe, click the bell, get a tattoo. No, don't get a tattoo. We'll see you next week. And don't forget to vote. If you want to stay on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbeoff, Andrew Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.